Now, this picture was taken at around 11.30 in the morning on the 2nd of May, 2009, bank holiday weekend. Let me take you back to that morning. Let me take you back to that morning when I was literally living the dream. And then at around maybe 5 p.m., the gentleman you see underneath the red and white canopy, who's a, a friend of mine called Simon, he said to me, shall we go back up? and just have maybe the last one hour of flight. I said, yeah, come on, why not? So we launched the canopies off the top ridge, and we started flying. Unfortunately, I flew into what they know as a crosswind, and I can still look down now and see my flying boots coming up at me. I hit the grass at probably around 25 miles an hour, which was bad enough. And I'm looking up at the blue sky, and I'm thinking to myself, wow. I was pretty close. I'll just get up now and pull in my lines and my canopy and just go back to the landing site. And then I thought, why can't I feel my legs? So I looked down and tried to sit up. And it was almost like I was Velcroed to the floor because I couldn't get my shoulders off the floor. So I physically pushed as hard as I could and nothing moved. How grateful was I that this amazing charity with these trained paramedics were on the scene within minutes. Now, we all know about the golden hour. When you have a near-fatal accident, you have to be in hospital probably within 45 minutes to 50 minutes to get the treatment that you actually need. And even to this day, I'm most grateful for this gentleman who worked on me a gentleman called Ross Griffin. It's people like Ross and CJ who never get the thank yous that they really need, that they deserve when they save people's lives. Now at this moment, this guy who is trained to do what he needs to do, exactly like you, in a professional environment, was probably just going about his daily job of saving lives. So I had my MRI scan and I had my x-ray and I remember the nurses walking in and saying to me, Mark, you're in good hands. And I kept thinking about the Niran Bevan and, and how much he's transformed this amazing world-class service. To then see the doctor walk in and say to me, Mr. Colborn, I've got some really bad news for you. I said, that's fine. Just, just tell me what I've done, you know, because in my mind, I just wanted to know. He said, unfortunately, you've broken your back. Now, when somebody gives you that kind of news, it doesn't really sink in. And then I was taken to an amazing rehabilitation hospital in Cardiff called Rookwood, which you may or may not know. It's almost like Stoke Mandeville for rehabilitation for, you know, for neuro, uh, neuro accidents and, and spinal. And I remember waking up the very first morning and thinking to myself, they say that life begins at 40. And it certainly did for me. But every single nurse, every OT, every physiotherapist, every doctor that I spoke to were positive that I was going to be okay. And after the first maybe four or five weeks, I kept thinking, I'm just going to put my life in their hands and I'm going to trust them. I kept saying to Mr. Inman, who was my consultant, can you explain why my feet don't work? Because I've got no push or pull in both feet. He said, unfortunately, you've smashed all the nerves in your back that go to your feet, so they'll never work again. You've damaged all the nerves to your hamstrings and bum muscles, so they'll never work again. I'm thinking, okay. After they hoisted me out of bed and took me over to the physiotherapist in the gymnasium with my walking frame, with my name on it, which was really embarrassing, <laughs> to learn to walk again with only half my legs working. And what they identified, thankfully, was that my quads and hip flexors weren't affected because of breaking T12. How grateful was I? Because what that meant was, through my rehabilitation, they sat me onto the static bike, one of these gymnasium bikes, you know. And as I sat on the bike, I said to Samantha, whoa, stop. I said, remember, I've got drop foot. My feet don't work, so if I started to pedal, they would just flop. Oh, yeah, of course, yeah. 
hang on a second, love, because that's what they say in Wales. And she came back with a roll of bandage, and they bandaged my feet to the pedals, which meant that I could actually just turn the pedals, no resistance, but ever so slowly, just to get the old heart working. And I turned to, Sam to Samantha, and I said, you know what? I don't feel disabled. Because when I'm walking like Charlie Chaplin, it was horrible. How grateful was I to that lady to put me onto that bike to get me to turn the pedals. That feeling was the same feeling as flying. I didn't feel disabled. And I kept saying to Samantha, thank you so much. Thank you for, for introducing me through your knowledge and your skills, like you, to help me not feel disabled. And yet when I stepped back off the bike, on my walking frame, back to the ward, I was back in that depression state again. And this went on for possibly three months, until thankfully I left hospital. And Mr. Inman said to me, good luck for your future, Mark. Your life may never be the same again. I hope he was watching the London Paralympics. <laughs> so what I focused on was what I could do rather than what I couldn't do. I couldn't run, skip, rock climb anymore. But every time I stepped onto that bike, I didn't feel disabled. And that was all thanks to Samantha, just opening that door for me. So I say this to you, focus on what you're good at. And don't worry about what you're no, that you're not good at, because that's just your skill set of who you are as people. This was my dream. So I wrote down a plan with Disability Sport Wales, how to get to the London Paralympic Games. So ask yourself, what's your goal in life? What do you want to achieve? Because trust me, almost anything is achievable. Disability Sport Wales helped me to get into the British cycling team. They worked as a team, the secretaries, the chief executives, the coaches, the helpers, the advisors. I couldn't do it on my own. So working as a team, think about the analogy of the word team. Together, everyone achieves more. How true is that? You work in an environment, a very stressful, high-pressured environment. Don't try and do it on your own. Rely on the people around you, like I did. I was very grateful that British Cycling took me away over the summer of 2011 to five international races. I came back with five medals. Now they're listening. Now they're listening. I was prepared to put my money where my mouth was because I, I had to do this. I had to do this. I was told that because I only had 12 months, literally 12 months with British Cycling, to train for the London Paralympic Games, my training had to be very different. So my coach said, Mark, we're going to have to double up on your training. I said, Tom, that's fine. That's fine, you know. He said, yeah, but we need you to do 50 miles in the morning. Come home, have your food, and 50 miles in the evening. Now, I'm from Tredegar, and I wasn't very good at maths, but I can work that out. <laughs> So how prepared are you to go that extra mile, to deliver that service, that world-class service that you can be proud of? That you can be proud of. You're not there just for your salary. You're not there just to pay your mortgage. You're there because you want to be there. Because you're the best of the best in the field that you work in. Why did they employ you and not somebody else? Because you are world-class. Think about this. Always be the best you can be. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you'll always be the best. But always be proud of your achievements.
than that. Two world records and a gold medal from two performances today. Mark Coburn has got his gold in the best possible style. When I came off, as you can imagine, there's just this euphoric feeling again, you know, and Paralympics GB, all the coaches and the management staff and the mechanics and the helpers and the volunteers, just so many people that I had to thank. So I said to my coach, wow, I can't believe I broke the world record again. I said, how much did I break it by? He said, it's probably about, say, six or seven inches, which is probably the length of that box, over 12 laps, which is quite astonishing which is quite astonishing, but even more astonishing in what is what's in it. <laughs> now for me, to have dreamt for this moment for my dad was just a euphoric feeling. You know, it really was. So thank you very much for your time. You've been a fantastic audience and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.